Chapter 271, The Search Translator, Endless Fantasy Translation Editor, Endless Fantasy Translation Grimm and Nina York forfeited their original plans to visit the rest of the sorcerers that they knew. They hurriedly left Black Isotta Sorcerer Academy. They flew across the sky at high speed, swiftly and gingerly brushing the vicious thorn forest beneath their feet. Grimm's loose black sorcerer's rope was fluttering about in the wind. Beneath the mask of truth, he bore an expression that was lost, anxious, and sad. Nina was riding on a broom. She turned and looked at Grimm with concern. Grimm, if we really do find Le Fay, what do you plan to do? There's a bounty on her, now that she's become an apprentice of the black sorcerer. Nina asked worryingly. A thought crossed her mind that Grimm might do something stupid. Grimm bit his lips tightly. He closed his eyes and shook his head. No, I know Le Fay. She's not that kind of person. There must be some reason for it. I must see her personally. Nina sighed. No matter the reasons, there's no turning back once she stepped into the path of the black sorcerer on the sorcerer continent. She can only hide in the corners of shadows like a rat. She could be hunted down by bounty hunters any time. With the wind blowing in their faces, Grimm shouted out in a deep tone. I know all this. I just want to ask her why she's acting this way. Even if she were to be hunted down in the sorcerer continent, I still want to see her for one last time. Sigh. Nina replied, Okay. Bone Bell Tower Academy has mobilized most of their sorcerers and elite sorcerer apprentices. They've hunted down quite a number of black sorcerer apprentices, but there's still no news of Le Fay. Let us first get to the site where news of the dark sorcerer apprentices had frequented and circle around from there. Okay. Grimm replied and followed in Nina's lead. This was a city located between the Black Isotta Sorcerer Academy and the Ivory Castle Sorcerer Academy, Versailles City. Versailles City had a population of about 700,000 people. Traders and knights passed through the city in huge numbers. It was an important transportation hub that was famous for its bristles, leather skins, cotton, and quartz. Hundreds of castles, small and large, were erected within and outside the city walls. Its bustling market streets painted a scene of prosperity, while its crossroads and junctions were filled with slums and dilapidated huts that housed the weak, the poor, and peasants. The slum was a breeding ground for sinister triads and villains from all walks of life. Stabbing incidents were frequent in this area. No law enforcement would set foot in here. Ursulus was an orphan born in the slums of Fansail City. Like most orphans, Ursulus did not know much about his own background. He relied on his cunning mind and his fit body to survive in the dog-eat-dog -dog world. Gradually, he too became one of the thugs on the street. At 19 years of age, Ursulus was 1.75 meters tall. He had a head of messy, brown hair. Sporting a greasy, hardened face, his eyes were like those of a venomous snake. There was always a creepy smile at his lip. He always carried a sheet dagger. Seven or eight other thugs followed him everywhere as he casually strolled around his territory. The thugs stopped at a run-down tailor shack. He he. Old man. You should thank your daughter that I didn't charge you any money last month. If you dare to complain again this month, he he, he he. Ursulus played around with the blade on his hand. He had the eerie smile of a villain. The old man at the tailor shack raised his head which was quivering in fear. It seemed that he would not be able to live for more than a few days. His hair had thinned to a few pathetic strands. But Ursulus didn't care anyway. The old man had always been this way for years. All the residents here have had a tough life. A woman in her thirties, who still had some beauty left in her features ran across hurriedly. Ursulus, my father will no longer give you any money. Not even a copper coin. Ursulus glanced at the woman as he coldly chided, 
you're but a maid of the Viscount, don't even dare think that you are his lover. Clang! 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 Slowly, from the alleyway, a stout knight approached full clad in metal armor. Beneath his helmet, his eyes were stern. These people are the subjects of the Viscount. The Lord's faith in the beacon of justice shall spread into each corner of the subjects. As the woman saw the approaching knight, she quickly leaned against him. Her posture strut up considerably straighter as he glared at Ursulus. A knight clad in full armor wasn't something that the thugs could toy around with. Ursulus clenched his teeth. It's that justice bastard again. How did this woman manage to seduce him? HMPH. Ursulus turned around and winked at the thugs. Instantly, one of the thugs caught the hint and ran off in a cold smile. The denizen always had his ways. Xiing. The stout knight pulled out his longsword and coldly declared, I am the Lord Viscount's escort knight. I will uphold justice by executing you guys right now. Not even the peacekeepers could touch us. Do you want to try it, boy? Ha ha ha, this was a misunderstanding. How could we ever offend Lord Viscount's faith in the justice system? We were merely. After a quick while, another knight quickly approached them on horseback. Aizu. The butler has summoned you back to your position right now. The Viscount is departing to his son's house. We heard that a sorcerer had come over to the city and the city gates have been shut. Something big is probably happening. The horse stopped between the two people as the rider passed the message to the knight who had a strong faith in maintaining justice. Conspiracy, this is a conspiracy, my lord. The woman begged at the armored knight. After hesitating for a moment, he saw a group of peacekeepers running across the street. Something had really happened. Finally, he shook his head and dared not delay any further. The armored knight sighed and rode off with the other rider to the distance. Slam! Ursulus pushed the woman away and slapped her hard till she was flung to the ground. He shouted at her, Bitch! I will let you know who's in charge of these streets. How dare you call someone over? Why don't you call him back right now? Call him. Call your justice here. The woman covered her head and wailed. The thugs gathered around and flogged the maid of the Viscount as well. They were careful not to hit her face though. Stop! Stop! Here, these are all my copper coins. The old man in the tailor shack tried his best to pull the men away, but it was all but futile. There were too many people looking. The hoodlums had to do something to show their power. However, they were just beating a female maid and they therefore didn't use too much strength. A while later, Ursulus held up his coin pouch smugly as he arrogantly led the thugs away. The denizens collectively shook their heads and sighed before slowly dispersing. Dusk descended and the skies began to dim. Within the filthy alleyways of the slums, Ursulus held onto his coin pouch and laughed. D.A. asterisk M.N., Justice almost got served today. What a bitch. The rest of the thugs joined his laugh. Only one of them looked around suspiciously. In a low voice, he said, Boss, this street ain't peaceful. I've heard that quite a lot of people have been stabbed by dark blades and have gone missing. Bah. We are the bosses here, who dares to touch us. Ursula slapped the guy smugly. The thug then nervously joined in their laughter. Huff, huff, huff. From a distance, the thug who ran away earlier tried to catch up with them. Ursulus burst into laughter. Hey, too mud. That was some fine work. The messenger shore threw the night off quickly. The thug who was still catching his breath looked surprised. Boss, I didn't even see the messenger. I couldn't even get into the Viscount's manor today. Huh? The thugs looked puzzled. 
At this moment, a chilling voice came out from the dilapidated house beside the thugs. Hee hee, I was just looking for a fresh batch of ingredients for my experiment. A water elemental aura soon emanated out of it. Chapter 272. Brianna. Translator. Endless Fantasy Translation Editor. Endless Fantasy Translation. Versailles City. Within the manor of the Viscount's son lay an opulence unfathomable by the denizens of the slums. There was a stench of lavish civilization and social etiquettes mixed with the vile and corrupt emanating from the very bones of these affluent-looking nobles. The nobles or their ancestors were either sorcerers from some academy or the offsprings of their apprentices. Some of them came into nobility through connected marriages. The nobles followed a very different system from the sorcerers. Their oppressive ways clamped down upon the peasants as they ruled, dominated, and pillaged with an iron fist. Viscount Snot was holding up a glass of wine. A well-rounded cheerful bloke, he passed between families of nobles and approached his two revered guests, accompanied by graceful music. He was also with his two daughters, who were wearing revealing corsets and thick makeup. Still, Viscount Snot thought ill of the other nobles, who brought their daughters along with them as well. These dirty maggots, they had their own lovers play the roles of their daughters. HMPH. While insinuating and insulting them in his mind, Snot went in front of the two revered guests. These were two sorcerer's apprentices. For the nobles, however, there was no distinction between sorcerers and their apprentices. They were both males. One of them was completely cloaked under S. loose fitting grey sorcerer's robe. The capillaries in his eyes were a bright, bloodshot red as he stared coldly at the crowd. His cold presence made him unapproachable, akin to a hungry wolf. The other person was wearing the same loose-fitting robe, but he was much more approachable. He looked like he was in his thirties. He had short hair and was smoking a pipe, happily chatting away with some of the young noble women. Snot pushed away some of the nobles unknowingly. He held his daughter's hands and walked in front of the sorcerers. With a gentle smile, he said, Revered sorcerers, we've followed your request to shut down all the city gates. Our guards have also been equipped with bows and crossbows. If anything happens, we'll let you know straight away. Decades ago, after Versailles City had killed their first black sorcerer, all the nobilities became afraid and spared no coins to hire knights as their bodyguards. To the black sorcerers, however, the knights were just a little stronger than the average human being. Right, understood. Gillance, they're ready. Let's not waste our time here and finish the mission. The cold, red-eyed sorcerer muttered in a hoarse voice. All the nobles who were present turned stiff at his rude utterings. How dare he call the meticulously arranged dinner party a waste of time? The young women who were initially cheery and trying to present themselves became quiet too after noticing the nobles' anger. They became teary-eyed and lost all sense of what to do next. Ed! The apprentice who had a tobacco pipe in his mouth yelled at the cold-eyed apprentice. He smiled apologetically to the nobles and pulled the cold-eyed apprentice across the hall to a corner. Etiquette? How many times do I have to tell? you, mind your etiquette. If you wish to complete this mission successfully, you better not piss them off. Else, these obnoxious people would make your life so miserable that we'll never find the person we're looking for. The pipe-smoking apprentice stopped for a moment before continuing. Also, do you think that this city, which had been searched every year for the past few decades could have a black sorcerer hiding here? After jeering at the cold-eyed apprentice, the pipe-smoking apprentice left him alone and headed for the pretentious nobles. HMPH, nobody knows. The cold-looking apprentice mumbled. The next day. Under the escort of hundreds of guardian knights, the two sorcerer apprentices searched castle by castle. All the castle lords opened their gates, ready to be searched and questioned. The search was an annual affair that had been going on for decades. All of this had taken almost an entire day. 
Come sunset, the sky began to dim. Wearily, the two sorcerer apprentices led the hundreds of guardian knights to the last market street. Since there was a search going on, the whole Versailles city had been put on curfew. There wasn't a single soul in the well-lit street. The peacekeepers, who were usually as lazy as parasites were busy tonight, running here and there to keep a lookout and, as their name suggested, maintaining the peace. Phew, the crystal balls finished recording. Mission complete. The pipe-smoking apprentice breathed a sigh of relief as he took in a nice, long puff. The rest of the exhausted noblemen and knights too breathed a sigh of relief. Finally, they could return home to rest. There was joy on their tired faces. However, the cold-eyed sorcerer's apprentice yelled out loudly, Hold on, we haven't checked this place yet. The cold-eyed apprentice pointed at a very dark corner, making it hard to make out the roads and surroundings. It was putrid, filthy and there was a foul stench coming out from there. The faces of all the noblemen and the knights turned. Viscounts not quickly explained, great sorcerers, this is where the denizens live. Other than the overpacked denizens, the worms, cockroaches, and rats in the mud, no one would be here. The foul stench that emanated from within could not be suppressed even if Venus, the goddess of love herself were to be carried here from Ivory Castle Academy. How could one as noble as you? The pipe-smoking apprentice too shook his head. Ed, you're too nervous. Even a fallen black sorcerer wouldn't choose to live here. T.S.K. Huff. The pipe-smoking apprentice took another deep puff. He blew out a cloud of smoke to cover the stench coming from within. No. Our mission was to search the whole Versailles city. We must not overlook any corner. The master had always reminded us that the devil's in the details. The demon-hunting sorcerer of the Holy Tower is always reserved for those who are one step ahead of the others. The nobleman looked in distraught at the pipe-smoking sorcerer's apprentice. The pipe-smoking sorcerer took another puff. After looking at the cold-eyed sorcerer's apprentice's determined expressions, he felt troubled for a moment. He then came to a decision and yelled, Continue. Viscounts not tried to stop him. Sir. I said continue. The pipe-smoking apprentice did not allow any defiance to his words. He waved his magic staff and pointed at the dark, dirty, smelly alleyway. Sigh. Clop. 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 As the Viscount waved his hand, the group of knights galloped into the dirty alleyway. The mud on the street which was soiled with feces and urine splattered around as the horses kicked them up with their hooves. The aristocratic noblewomen covered their noses with handkerchiefs. Their faces were pale white, yet they dared not venture away on their own. It was hard to imagine that for decades, none of the sorcerer's apprentices had ever set foot into this area. First of all, they wouldn't dirty themselves. Secondly, they had in mind that the previous apprentices had checked the place. The third was the so-called logical reasoning, no black sorcerer would be caught living in this dilapidated environment. Peacekeeper, where is the street that often had reports of missing persons? The cold-eyed apprentice took a glance at the fat person beside him and asked. Ah, uh, here. The peacekeepers never cared for these things. He desperately grabbed hold of another lackey peacekeeper beside him and asked, where's the place where denizens would go missing around here? It was the lackey peacekeeper's first time approaching the mysterious, terrifying sorcerer. His heart was racing as he pointed at a distance. There. It is there where incidents would always happen. The cold sorcerer waved his hand. Come, let's go there. Clop, clop, clop clop. The horses trotted across the mud as they braved the overpowering stench, going in the direction pointed by the cold-eyed sorcerer. Many denizens peeked sheepishly through their windows from both sides of the alleyway as the torch-bearing knights passed through them. Moments later. Halt! 
The pipe-smoking sorcerer's apprentice screamed in bewilderment. There was a red blip on the crystal ball in his hand. A black sorcerer. A black sorcerer. A black sorcerer's hiding here. He screamed frightfully. The pipe-smoking sorcerer and the cold-looking sorcerer's faces quickly turned to fear. They were in sheer terror although they were the sharpest of the sorcerer's apprentices once they encountered the enemy of humanity, even if only a black sorcerer apprentice. HMPH. I've got to change spots again. Damn you both. A dark, hoarse, angry voice came out. In an old dilapidated hut, an eye that had a golden iris opened up slowly. The terrifying aura of human despair covered the black sorcerer's apprentice which also made all the knights who were present shiver uncontrollably. The horses neighed in fear and started to panic out of control. It was the stench of humanity's sworn enemy. The pipe-smoking sorcerer's apprentice took out the reward scroll and whispered at the cold-eyed apprentice who stood beside him. Bounty for the sixth apprentice of the black sorcerer, Brianna. Be careful, this is a terrifying person who left Black Isota Academy 200 years ago. We're no match for her. Try to hold her off until our master arrives after he receives our signal. Oh. With anguished wails, the knights were being turned into dried carcasses. Their deaths looked horrible. He he. He he. Those who are here today, don't even think you can escape. An old witch held up her black magic staff as she cried out hysterically. Her looks were completely different from the blonde-haired, cute, bright but prideful and fussing over the most trivial matter Brianna that Grimm used to know. Badam. A tumor at the back of the witch's head pulsated violently. Chapter 273. Already a legend. Translator. Endless Fantasy Translation Editor. Endless Fantasy Translation. Burn her. Burn the evil black sorceress. Og, no. Shouts and wails mixed together in a terrifying amalgamation. A knight's mount fell amongst the panicked neighs of the horse. Some threw their torches and swords away. A fire was rising in the calm night. The sorceress' face was covered in hives. The hideous sorceress Brianna broke into a crazy laugh, showing two rows of dark, cracked and incomplete teeth. She slowly took out a black skull with her frail, wrinkled hand. The skull's eyes flashed red. Illusory images of despaired humans started to appear flying above the skull. When the images came into contact with the attacking knights, they fell along with their horses onto the ground. Their flesh shriveled, eye sockets depressed inward until they met their grotesque doom. Black magic. This is black magic. Get away from the skull's image. The knights cried out in terror from the depths of their hearts, trembling at the mysterious black sorcery. Behind, the pale-faced young noblewomen looked hopefully at the two sorcerer's apprentices. The cunning nobles were quiet as they took a few steps back. They were ready to run away at any given moment. The pipe-smoking apprentice puffed out a cloud of thick smoke as he carefully took out a brown pouch from his chest. Brown dust was scattered in the air as it was blown stealthily by his smoke toward the terrifying black sorcerer. On the other hand, the cold-eyed sorcerer's apprentice had his eyes closed as he read some incantations. It seemed to be a spell that was beyond his level as he had been channeling the spell for quite some time behind the knights who were fighting at the front lines. Slowly, a powerful magical force started to come through. The apprentice's blood-red eyes widened slowly. Superconducting spell, the funeral of lightning. A bright light shone across the sky. At the piercing boom of thunder, a green column of lightning that had the thickness of a baby's arm struck the black sorceress at breakneck speed. The two sorcerer's apprentices seemed to have the same level of power that the top ten masters of the Black Isota once had. But still. Old sorceress Brianna's murky eyes looked toward them as she smiled belittlingly. Childish. She extended her frail palm out. A huge cloud of mist burst out from her dark magical staff and merged with the elements of water. 
Bam! The water column was projected toward the brilliant lightning column. There was no explosion as expected. In the disbelief and gaping stares of the cold-eyed apprentice, his lightning column appeared to have been melted away by the black water column and was now coming toward his direction. Get out of the way! The cold-eyed apprentice was able to yell out a warning. In a huge explosive boom, the earth trembled ever so slightly. Some of the houses in the slum collapsed. The noble women who were wearing their bright, beautiful dresses had their flesh melted away before they could even squeal. Only their white skeletons remained. Ah, run! Run from the devil! The nobles were scared beyond their wits. They frantically drove their chariots and tried to flee from the slums. The terrorized chariot drivers no longer had regard for their noble lords and chariots as they had already bolted away on foot without a trace. When the dust settled, more than half of the knights were dead in the massacre. In front of old sorceress Brianna, there were seven to eight images of human figures in despair swallowing the hidden spell that was cast by the pipe-smoking apprentice. The old sorceress's pair of murky eyes were locked onto the two terrified sorcerer's apprentices. She's too strong. She, she's someone who had lost in the Holy Tower qualification battle of the Black Isota Academy two centuries ago. Now, the only one who can defeat her is Mira of Darkness, the legendary sorcerer apprentice. She's simply too strong. The redness in the cold-eyed sorcerer's apprentice eyes disappeared, replaced by terror and hopelessness. There was always human despair attached to a dark sorcerer's spell. Their attack speed was much faster than the absolute limit of an average low-leveled sorcerer. It was no wonder that even a sorcerer who was at the same level would feel powerless. The pipe-smoking apprentice quickly climbed up from the ground and ran in one direction without looking back. He shouted, run for your lives! The knights had already lost their courage as they scattered in fear. They wished they had an extra pair of legs. He he, running away? Better stay here quietly. Brianna was laughing like a mad hatter. She licked her lips and boom. Her body dissipated into a cloud of mist before converging some ten meters away. She grabbed hold of the pipe-smoking sorcerer apprentice with her single frail hand. Her dark fingernails pierced into his flesh. No. The pipe-smoking apprentice felt as if an iron chain had been put around his neck. In a despairing wail, his neck was broken as he struggled to break free. Badum. The tumor at the back of Brianna's head pulsated violently. She laughed again crazily as she turned her head, looking toward the other apprentice who no longer looked cool. At the same time, the skull on Brianna's hand flashed in red again as it sucked the soul of the pipe-smoking apprentice into its mouth. There was a faint echo from the tormented soul. He he, little one. Now that you've ruined my work, you too will accompany him. Hum. Brianna was about to cast some dark evil spell when she suddenly felt a strange sensation. She raised her head, looked up and couldn't believe what she saw. You, you're Brianna. A surprised voice came through. There were two figures hovering quietly in the sky. Among them, an old sorceress was scrutinizing her as she checked her reward scroll. She seemed. Nina York. You're one who's always with that bastard. Before Brianna could finish her words, she saw the mysterious man who wore a white mask beside her. Her murky eyes squinted for a moment as she began to tremble instinctively. She then roared in disbelief like a wild animal. Grim. Brianna instantly lost all her fighting spirit. Her body exploded into a cloud of mist and converged again at a distance. Her face was filled with terror and she became reckless. She only had one thing in her mind, to run away from the cursed place. That guy's the devil a real demon. Brianna would never forget the scene at the Holy Tower qualification battle. His mere presence felt like the devil himself. Brianna knew that even after two centuries, she was no match for the devil. 
The devil was too powerful. Brianna. Beneath the mask of truth, Grimm was utterly perplexed. Could this be Brianna? Brianna, the blonde, long-haired girl with a fair complexion, who was protected like a baby along with Kyrie. Could it be the same Brianna that was always guarded by two sorcerers years ago who used to hold their noses and complain about the smell in the ship's cabin on the sea ferry? In the recruit tryouts that followed, it was she who was bullied by Sun Child. She then ganged up with Solemn, Kyrie, and Grimm as they beat Sun Child until she forfeited her final reward. And then, her silent battle that followed with Le Fay which ended in a tie. Even her senior in Black Isota Academy tried to avenge her until Grimm stepped in. It took Le Fay years to recover. All these memories, memories of a girl who was treated like a princess, one who received the best of care available. But now, the beautiful, naive girl who would hit back even at the smallest mistake, had turned into such a filthy, ugly, and reeking black sorcerer apprentice. She was so frail that she would be dead with a mere pinch. He he. Black sorcerer apprentice Brianna, how dare you run in the presence of the great sorcerers? Death shall be your ultimate refuge. Nina York laughed hysterically. She manipulated the natural forces and turned the cloud of mist back into Brianna. Boom. A sharp stone impaled Brianna through her heart. Ultimately, Brianna's elemental body was but an apprentice-level spell and not that of a level two sorcerers. Nina York walked casually to her body and cut off her hideous-looking head. Faced with the dramatic scene, a severe gap tore a wedge between Grimm and his memories. The little Nina who used to cower behind her brother had just casually killed Brianna who used to terrorize all the apprentices. Nina York threw Brianna's head into the dimensional pocket without a single ounce of care. She was a little chirpy as she remarked, at least I got something out of this, her head is worth quite some money. Nina, who had become a proper sorceress was used to being above the rest of the sorcerer apprentices even though Brianna was one of the legendary apprentices. Grimm nodded and said nothing. Great sorcerers, thank you for your help. On the ground, the cold-eyed sorcerer's apprentice that looked so hopeless just now shouted out his thanks in a most respectful manner. Grimm took a glance at the apprentice and wasn't bothered. Nina York, who was feeling great at that moment did not care for the apprentice at first. But she suddenly thought of something. She was supposed to lead Grimm into another location but stopped for a moment as she turned toward the apprentice that bowed respectfully at them. The sorcerer apprentice was already pushing his luck. He he, little guy, you're lucky to be able to witness the legendary nightmare level apprentice who used to be on top of the twelve black Isota academies. Grimm furrowed his brows and was disgusted by Nina's gloating. Stop wasting time. Nina York shook her head and smiled jokingly. She led Grimm off in the blink of an eye. Their fluttering loose robes vanished in the dark sky, leaving a yearning feeling in the cold-eyed apprentice. The cold-eyed apprentice widened his eyes, his face filled with awe. He mumbled in disbelief, the pale-masked Grimm from Black Isota Academy, the legend that swept across five continents. Just like Sister Quiet Spring, Grimm had become a legend that the low-leveled sorcerer apprentices looked up to in all the generations of apprentices among the twelve academies that followed their batch. Chapter 274, Tumus Translator, Endless Fantasy Translation Editor, Endless Fantasy Translation Fifteen days later After continuously searching around the cities that could potentially house the black sorcerers, they still had no clue about Le Fay's whereabouts. Grimm's patience was wearing thin. From what Nina had described, there was something peculiar about these black apprentices. They seemed to have appeared out of the blue in great numbers. They shared nothing in common and there wasn't any pattern that could lead to a clue. They have never even interacted with each other before. Although the black apprentices were a menace, they were no match for a proper sorcerer. They could simply hide like parasites within the blind spots of the sorcerer academies. The terrifying black sorcerer, 
Hattori the Hidden was another matter, however. Not only was he the source of the increase in the Black Apprentices, but the Holy Tower of the Seven Rings even recorded six cases of real sorcerers who were murdered in his name. One of the victims was a demon hunter who was on duty. But Grimm knew that for the past few days, the Bone Tower Academy had downplayed the number of incidents to protect their name. The situation was much grimmer than what was reported in the statistics. Therefore, Grimm was also being more cautious. Since Grimm used to harvest the Amonro's Tears of Sorrow in large quantities during his time in the Shadow World, his spells alone could deal hundreds of points of damage. At the peak of the war, he even faced off with level 2 Amonros on numerous occasions, causing him to know the terror that came along with it. As a dark sorcerer who specialized in the study of the occult codes of life and death and one who had been harvesting human despair in the sorcerer world for a long time, the upper limit of his damage would be much higher than Grimm's 2 to 300 points. Furthermore, during the new recruit tryouts, Hattori the Hidden had shown himself to be gifted in his moves. Hence, Grimm was on high alert. At this moment, Grimm and Nina York patrolled around a huge marshland known as the Withering Swamps. A constant fog covered the Withering Swamps all year round. Visibility around the area was less than 20 meters. There was some ecstasy-inducing matter ingrained within the mists that could cause hallucinations. The creatures in the swamps were very ferocious and often hunted each other for food. Within the unique biosphere, a creature known as the flower-scaled lizard stood at the top of the food chain. Whoosh! Whoosh! Grim and Nina hugged the ground as they flew, trying to look for any clues regarding the black sorcerers. A kaleidoscope of dry-leaf butterflies flew past Grim and Nina, vanishing in the thick mist. Grim stopped and let out a sigh. What? Nina looked back at Grim with a puzzled face. Grim shook his head. A place like this, and we're both not very good at sensing. This is like finding a needle in a haystack. Nina York was troubled. But this is the most likely place where the black sorcerers would fester. Apparently, the Bone Bell Tower Academy has listed this place as a hotspot. Combing this area is our best chance of finding the black sorcerer's trace. Grim looked down without a word. He seemed to be contemplating. Quite a moment later, Grim suddenly called out, Little Miner. There was a distortion in the space above his shoulder. A beautiful fluffy red and green miner appeared. Like a panting puppy, it dutifully asked, Core. Core. What's the matter? Master. As it spoke, it made a funny, playful rolling eye. Grim glared at the miner beneath his mask of truth. He asked in a cold manner, How far can you sense in such an environment? Grim let out another sigh. He had planned to finish up the second phase of the infinity eye and the eagle eye on his mask of truth. The great race of the steel emblem miners detects life forms through their breath. This type of environment is nothing at all for the great steel emblem miners. The miner proudly flicked his tail. It slowly turned around and noticed the sorceress beside him. It called out in surprise. Core? Master, this, this female human. Le Fay? The miner asked falteringly. Nina was astonished to see the miner on Grimm's shoulders. Both of her murky eyes were in shock. A soul partner from the principal source. As she saw that Minor was flabbergasted and had mistaken her for Le Fay, she couldn't help but shake her head slowly and let out a gentle smile. How do you do? I am Nina York, a friend of Grimm's. As she spoke, she placed a magical stone on her palm. After knowing the old sorceress in front of it wasn't Le Fay, the Minor just coldly nodded. It was a bit disappointed, but was puzzled by Nina's act of placing the magical stone on her palm. It called out in confusion. What are you doing? The air stifled with a little awkwardness at that moment. Nina looked at Grimm, then back at the miner. She was puzzled as well. Don't you eat this? Bah! 
you eat the stone yourself. A great miner like me, oh. Grim hit the miner at the back of its brains and angrily chided. If you do not want to eat it, then don't. Stop with all that nonsense and help me look for any humans around. After the incident, Grim said to Nina apologetically, Don't mind this guy, he's just like Master Piranos as Garnigel. They're both greedy bastards. Nina smiled awkwardly and stored her magic stone away. The more she looked at the miner, the more mysterious it became. It was such an enigma, a curiosity. The miner, however, strut its wings and tilted its head. It pointed to the left and sheepishly muttered, there's a presence of a few humans over that side. Let's go. After the miner's words, Grim and Nina flew toward the direction. After almost half an hour glass, Nina York and Grim bowed in accordance to a sorcerer's etiquette. A level two sorcerer who donned a straw hat stood on top of a huge beetle. Grim and Nina had to bow before him. Behind the level two sorcerer were seven to eight apprentices. They were astonished by the sudden appearance of Grim and Nina. Buzz. The massive beetle's wings flapped at a very high frequency. The mist around them blew wildly in the howling winds. The sorcerer in straw hat took a glance at Grim and Nina before asking intriguingly, Demon hunting sorcerers. Are you here for the black sorcerers? Other than the sorcerer's cloak, the best way to identify a demon hunting sorcerer was to gather the despair of unknown creatures from foreign worlds. The Amonro's despair that surrounded Grimm's body was the best proof of a demon hunting sorcerer. Of course, it was a high level sorcerer scouting out a low level sorcerer. Great Lord, we've come from Black Isota Sorcerer Academy. We were looking for an old partner who has been corrupted. If possible, we would like to meet her for one last time, Grimm said respectfully. The straw hat sorcerer replied, For three years, the sorcerers of Bone Bell Tower Sorcerers Academy have searched this area multiple times. We've hunted down four black apprentices. See if you can find your friend here. After that, the giant beetle spat out four black colored crystals consecutively. Both Grim and Nina's hearts almost jumped out. Clank! The four dark crystals shattered, revealing concealed heads. Grim naturally ignored the three severed male heads. The last head belonged to a female black apprentice that looked like she was in her forties. It wasn't Le Fay and there was nothing remarkable about it. Grim quietly breathed out a sigh of relief. He calmly said, Thank you great lord, the friend I was looking for isn't there. Oh, good then. The straw hat sorcerer ordered the giant beetle to gather back the severed heads of the black apprentices. At the same time, his face was stern. Actually, if it was your old friend, there might be a small chance that you could still save him. Grim and Nina, who were about to take their leave were startled. Grim's eyes were filled with disbelief. He cried out, Great Lord, what do you mean? Did you mean that there's some way to repent? No, no, no. The straw hat sorcerer shook his head and said three no's in a row. He then continued in a serious manner, now normally, once an elemental sorcerer becomes corrupted, he would surely be hunted down with bounty offered by the sorcerer academies and the holy tower institutes. But there's one exception and that is if the sorcerer has been corrupted not by his own will. You mean to say, Grim asked anxiously. The straw hat sorcerer grabbed hold of one of the severed heads that wasn't swallowed by the beetle. He pointed at the back of the head. There was a beating tumor. They were actually, enslaved by Hartori the Hidden. Their path of corruption toward the dark side wasn't part of their will. The straw hat sorcerer shook his head and said pitifully, I'd never thought that he could combine his talents with symbiotic insects and create a powerful spell which could enslave sorcerer apprentices who were highly intelligent and had high mental strength. He's a genius sorcerer that only appears once every 10,000 years. Too bad, he chose the path of corruption on his own accord. This is a secret that I found out three months ago, 
I'm ready to report this finding to the Holy Tower of Seven Rings to begin the real demon hunt. Grimm's eyes twitched in disbelief. A black sorcerer who enslaved the sorcerer apprentices. One must know that the sorcerer apprentices, being the bridge between normal humans and real sorcerers, were very difficult to be enslaved. This was due to their high intelligence, high mental capability, and the protection offered by the principal will of the sorcerer world as well as various other reasons. It would be as hard as a level 1 sorcerer to tame a level 3 soul slave. But this new black sorcerer from the Bone Bell Tower Sorcerer Academy in Section 12 of the Holy Tower of Seven Rings. According to history books, the sorcerer's mainland had produced a few terrifying black sorcerers that had similar abilities. Each of these black sorcerers became infamous legends of their times. Their destructive level was second to that of a few evil black sorcerers who had gone against the interests of the world. Clink. The Straw Hat Sorcerer cast a spell that covered the severed head with dark crystals again and threw them into the giant beetle's mouth. I call these tumors the Hartori Bugs. Their function is to enslave the sorcerer apprentices and pass down the power of despair to their queen. That is to say, these black apprentices were just tools of Hartori the Hidden to gather the despair of humans while he went into hiding. After letting out a sigh, the Straw Hat Sorcerer continued. If you want to save your friend, there is only one way. You'll have to make Hartori the Hidden order the Queen to recall the bug on your friend. Remember, don't take it out by force, or else you might not be able to collect your rewards. After finishing his words, the Straw Hat Sorcerer smiled and no longer bothered Grimm and Nina. He led his group of apprentices and carried on on his way. Master Grimm. Grimm, we still have hope. If we could make a deal with Phantom Thief, perhaps we could. Grimm stopped Minor and Nina's consolation mid-sentence. He was terrifyingly cold in demeanor. He said calmly, let's just continue, we must find Le Fay. Of course, Grimm knew what the Straw Hat Sorcerer meant when he said he wouldn't be able to collect his reward. It meant that the Black Apprentice's head would explode if he were to forcefully extract the bug. Chapter 275, The Inspiring One Translator, Endless Fantasy Translation Editor, Endless Fantasy Translation Grimm and Nina circled above the Peronwood Range for more than ten days without any luck. Half a month had passed in the Western Thorns. Grimm and Nina's search still turned up empty. In the blink of an eye, a year had passed. An impatient Grimm looked down at the city from above the sky. In a deep voice, he asked, Nina, where are we now? This is the intersecting region between the Twelfth Dark Sorcerer's Camp and the Nineteenth Bright Sorcerer's Camp. This small town is known as Europa. The place we're heading to is the Liquid Bone Caves 300 kilometers away from here. It's a natural underground labyrinth. A dark sorcerer would definitely have an advantage hiding there. As Nina finished her words, the miner that was perching on Grimm's shoulder complained, Master, let's go down and ask around first. While we're there let's get some food. My palate's been dry these few days. Nina's wrinkled, old face squeezed out a smile. For quite a while now, Nina had taken an interest in the miner. She then nodded at Grimm. Why don't we take a rest here? We've been going on for days without a shower. Grim pondered for a moment but nodded in agreement frustratingly. The miner laughed in a scheming manner. It flapped its wings and was the first to fly toward the city beneath their feet. At the busiest Everton Hotel within Europa City. Pete Gilly bowed and smiled forcefully. There was a white cloth on his shoulder as he skillfully carried dishes to the customers downstairs, hoping to earn some extra tips. Moments later, Pete came back with a grumpy face. He was grumbling, these poor bastards, they couldn't even spare an extra copper coin. Huh? At this moment, the people in the inn cried out in astonishment. Pete turned around and was surprised to find a beautiful, Plump Miner flapping around on the dining table. Huh? 
which noble's pet escaped? Pete was annoyed, but he didn't dare to harm the beautiful fat miner. He only whipped his wipe cloth around the table surface as he shouted, Go away. Stop fooling around here, go somewhere else. Bastard, do you want to die? Miner screeched angrily at the waiter who tried to shoo it away with a wipe cloth. Its feathers almost exploded in rage. Holy mother! Pete was startled. He took two steps to the back and hugged a table as he stared at the miner in terror. Yes, a miner can speak. But with such brevity. And such attitude. At this moment, not only the inn, even the street was filled with astonished calls. In dead silence, two sorcerers landed slowly on the ground and walked into the inn. The two sorcerers, one an old sorceress, the other an enigmatic man in a white mask. Both of them didn't care for the crowd's ruckus as they sat beside the miner. Instantly, the crowd on the street fled and vanished. Even the people in the inn quietly left one by one. Unlike the well-informed cities in the center and the ignorant small town in the islands, the border cities, especially those within range of dark sorcerer academies had always perceived the sorcerers as mysterious, cruel, and terrifying. The appearance of black sorcerers these past few years had perpetuated such rumors. The wickedness and power of the sorcerers made people turn their tails and run away. There were also countless rumors about how the nobles had conspired with sorcerers. Even though stories of the black apprentices had only appeared in the outskirt cities of Section 12 for the past few decades, it was half a lifetime for normal human beings. They were so rooted in their perceptions that heroic tales about the sorcerers that had been passed down by the older generations were soon forgotten. There were even rumors that said those who participated in the sorcerer apprentice recruit tryouts every ten years were actually eaten by the evil sorcerers. They feasted on the eyeballs of little children, made a paste out of their innards, drank fresh blood of virgin boys, and weaved carpets out of their hair. It wasn't hard to understand why. Normally, when a child had been accepted to the Sorcerer Academy, even if he was lucky enough to have survived, he would only return back to his home after centuries had passed. By then, everything would have changed. A century was far too long for their parents and for the average human being, but legends still passed on. Therefore, it wasn't any wonder that their parents would think that they've died. Such was the difference in the hierarchy of life that couldn't be explained. Even a sorcerer who had mastered limitless powers would not care to explain to these lower life forms. Ma, master, master sorcerer, what are your orders? As Pete spoke, he was trembling in fear and almost peed his pants. His teeth were chattering non-stop. Core. Core. Show me any bat dish you have. The miner opened its beak and asked. Pete turned pale, his almost crying. He sobbed, and no, we don't serve bat meat here. At this moment, Pete was fearful that as the consequence of his words, the two terrifying sorcerers would turn to him and say, since there's no bat meat, we'll eat you up instead. Stomp, stomp, stomp. Right then, a fat man who was wearing exquisite rings in each of his ten fingers while holding a gentle black cat ran down from the first floor breathlessly after seeing the two sorcerers. Unlike the low-leveled peasants, as a rich merchant who had been in constant contact with nobilities, Everton knew about some secret rumors of the sorcerers. Just treat those people like gods, the reward would be beyond belief. Because they would pay in a high-level currency known as magic stones boss. The weeping Pete saw his boss as his savior. He almost kneeled down and hugged his employer's feet. Go away, you useless trash. The fat man scolded Pete, but it sounded like a voice from heaven to him. Pete was so touched to hear his voice, he almost wanted to give him a hug and kiss him. He could finally leave the two cannibals. Pete fled without a trace. The fat man bloomed into laughter. It was troubling to the fat man really, since a person of his weight had to bow to such a degree. Oh great sorcerers, how could we serve you, 
we will definitely. Hey! Hey, it's a damned black cat. Master, put this black cat into a stew and make us some glazed black cat. Today, the miner shall get his revenge. The miner was triggered by the black cat in the fatty's hand. It flapped around hysterically. The fat man was startled himself too. He looked at the miner that was jumping around on the table in shock. At the same time, he held the cat in his chest even tighter. This. Is this the power of sorcerers? They've turned a miner into a monster. Or did they hex a person into the miner? Or was the miner a legendary monster? Grimm said nothing. Nina studied the menu and ordered a bunch of items in her hoarse voice. After seeing the fat man who was still stunned, she asked in an eerie tone, What? Is there a problem? The, the, the parrot, um, the great parrot said that it wanted to eat glazed black cat, the fat man said falteringly. He was also observing the old sorceress expression. The prized cat that had been by his side for seven or eight years, he really couldn't do it, it was like a son to him. Also, his herd of glazed bananas, which were indulgences of the nobility, but glazed black cat. Even if the sorcerers were as evil, cruel, and perverse in the rumors, could they really bear to eat cat's meat? Why, are you out of honey? Can't you make it? Honey was one of the most precious ingredients for the common man. Nina, who was born among the hunters could faintly recall the memories of her childhood. In annoyance, Nina took out a crystal bottle and passed it to the fat man. She said coldly, use this, it's refined cotton honey. The fat man's face was twisted and red. He accepted Nina's crystal bottle breathlessly. There was a huge gap in understanding between the two beings from completely different levels. After looking at the cool, calm, and murky eyes of the old sorceress in front of him, the fat person hadn't had much courage to say anything more. He clenched his teeth decisively as he turned around sobbingly. Cor! Cor! Nina, I guess he's never accepted anything from a sorcerer and was almost touched to tears. I'll remember your treat this time, next time I will also. Miner now had higher opinion of Nina. It felt very contented. Nina had a smile on her wrinkled face. The more she looked at the miner, the more she liked it. If only her squirrels were still alive, how good would it be? Memories of her past, as well as her brother. After half an hour glass. The trio, after quietly having a few tastes of the feast wiped their mouths. For sorcerers who had lived centuries, all delicacies had lost their appeal. And the fact of the matter was, glazed black cat was indeed disgusting. Even the vengeful miner couldn't help but complain. Damn, black cats sure taste terrible. I'm never touching those again. Nina threw a few pieces of magic stones at the anxious, emotional, but hopeful fat man. She gently said to him, get us two rooms with hot water. Yes, yes, yes. The utterly excited fat man received the magic stones and ran without a trace. Even his sadness over the loss of his black cat disappeared. He was overjoyed. Just as the calm grim was about to rise up and leave, Nina became startled as she turned and saw a figure that was leading a few nobles toward them at the hotel's entrance. Hem? That red-eyed frog, that sorcerer. Master Apollo. Grim and Nina both stood up in disbelief as they called out in unison. That shocked the miner that was preparing to rest after the meal. It stared at the sorcerer who made a sudden appearance. The person in front of them was the sorcerer who represented Section 19 of the Holy Tower of the Seven Rings in the Eastern Coral Islands, Lilith Sorcerer Academy in selecting qualified sorcerer's apprentices who either had the intelligence or natural mental abilities seven or eight centuries ago, Master Apollo. The inspiring one who taught Grimm that knowledge was the principal source of all sorcerers. Sorcerers were human scholars who observe, learn, and draw conclusions from the arcane patterns of all phenomena, 
and leverage the laws of the world with trace energy. Chapter 276, Emotional. Translator, Endless Fantasy Translation Editor, Endless Fantasy Translation. Hem. And who might you be? Apollo was dressed in loose-fitting sorcerer robes. He donned a tall, pointy hat. There was a faint mist of elemental energy covering his face. A red-eyed frog rested on his palm, its lower neck expanded and inflated as it croaked. The red-eyed frog was Apollo's sole partner and shared the same relationship between Grimm and Minor and Piranos and Garnigel. For years, his friendly and cool-headed appearance of a bright sorcerer had not changed at all. At this moment, he was leading some common nobleman in what seemed like an investigation. Perhaps the sudden appearance of Grimm and Nina York caused quite a commotion in the city. Could it be that Apollo, who was socializing with the nobleman came over out of curiosity? Grimm could never forget. In those years, Grimm was still a kid earning his keep doing odd jobs in the Viscount's residence of Bicea City. He thought that the eastern coral island was all there was in the whole continent. He was driven to work like a slave by the old butler and had no expectations of his future. The first time he met Nina York, she was cowering behind his brother Shiley and was a cute girl who wasn't even brave enough to try the beauty clam. Three centuries had passed in the blink of an eye. From the batch of children selected from each corner of the eastern coral island, two had actually become real sorcerers like Apollo. They could now converse at the same level as the sorcerer who used to be mysterious and powerful back then. Is this what it feels to be a sorcerer? Thinking back about how he had always looked up to the mystical sorcerers during his childhood, he felt a deep emotion. In the eyes of a commoner, sorcerers were enigmatic, distinguished, and beyond imagination. But after walking the path himself, Grimm found out that sorcerers were but mere human beings, who were incessant in their pursuits for the archaic truths. That the sorcerers were always mysterious and unattainable in the eyes of normal human beings was because their eyes were covered by a thin veil between truth and illusion. They could only make out what's for dinner, who had a better-looking wife, and where to go for better earnings. Grimm smiled. Compared to Nina, whose eyes were filled with emotions, he was much calmer. Slowly, Grimm took off his mask of truth to reveal his true face. He exposed his wise-looking face. It was different compared to the usual cruel face worn by dark sorcerers. Yet, Grimm still greeted the sorcerer in his standard dark sorcerer fashion. His long blonde hair was fluttering as he spoke in a hoarse voice and looked Apollo in the eyes, Master, do you still remember about two centuries ago? You were selecting sorcerer apprentices at the Eastern Coral Island region at Lilith Sorcerer Academy. The Eastern Coral Island. Apollo looked at Grimm and Nina in astonishment. He slowly said, You mean? Suddenly, Apollo seemed to have recalled something. Oh yes. Before and after I went deep underground, I went on a mission to recruit sorcerer apprentices in the Eastern Coral Island for the Academy. My first mission was to select some of the apprentices into the sea ferry led by Dilla, which was later hijacked by Black Isota Sorcerer Academy. You mean to say that you guys were? Apollo's eyes lit up and swept past the dark sorcerers Grimm and Nina emotionally, trying to recall back his dust-sealed memories. Nina's old sorceress features revealed a nostalgic shy smile as if she were reminiscing the green, innocent past. On the other hand, Grimm took out a meditation manual, a gift from Apollo in those days. Grimm said gratefully, if Master had not given me the enlightening quote of grant me infinite knowledge, and I shall be as a fulcrum, to move the endless world, then maybe I would not be able to become a real sorcerer. Nina who was standing beside too joined in the conversation. I would also like to thank Master's forbearance. My brother and I used a pitiful bribe of a few magic stones to get your approval for us to become sorcerer apprentices. There was brilliance in Nina's murky two eyes. I remember now. Apollo exclaimed emotionally as Grimm and Nina invited him to sit with them. At first, Apollo looked at Grimm. Yes, during those years, 
a boy named Grimm asked me about the theory of spellcasting. I was pleased that he didn't ask me to teach him spells for the purpose of killing others and gifted him with a meditation manual. You are Grimm. Grimm nodded, his long blonde hair fluttering in the air and answered happily, Yes, I am Grimm, the Grimm that you always complimented with very good. Apollo laughed after learning his answer. He turned around to Nina York. You've just said something about your brother. You must be Nina York then, the precious daughter of the Lord of Bysir Castle who couldn't be anywhere without her brother. Yes, I am Nina York. Nina's frail face turned into a smile. Apollo nodded and smiled. He he, in those situations, bribing was secondary. What was important was that you've used your wisdom. This is the most basic foundation for a sorcerer, and what the sorcerer's academies were looking for in an apprentice. Although the bribe was only a few measly pieces of magic stones, you've used your wisdom, unlike those fools who only do things by the book. Apollo paused for a moment before continuing, right, and then there's Wade, who also tried to bribe me with some magic stones. There's also another little guy called Robinson. I couldn't imagine during those days that there were two sorcerer apprentices who had mental strength points over ten in the eastern coral island. Apollo looked back at Grimm slowly. I could sense an instinctive friendly energy in your primary soul, but also a terrifying presence that would make others shiver in fear. Grimm smiled and gave no answer. The friendliness probably came from the protection offered by the principal will of the world as well as his rank three honor badge. The terrifying presence was probably due to the killings after the violent slaughter in the demon hunting expedition. Nina then slowly recollected the past. Wade? I remember he was killed when the sea monster attacked the ferry. Robinson, Le Fay, and my brother, Chris York, the five of us were in Black Isota Sorcerer Academy. One's a bright sorcerer while the other two were dark sorcerers. The three sorcerers had crossed the lines between the bright and dark sorcerers. They were conversing together on the dining chairs of the normal human world without holding back. Time flew without them realizing. Five hourglasses had passed. Five hourglasses meant ten hours. For the sorcerers, it was but a moment. But for the average human nobles, it was a long time. Some of them started to snore in exhaustion. Apollo let out a sigh. I wouldn't have guessed. La Fay, the little girl who was really reluctant to head into the sorcerer continent but was pushed to do so by her father, had become this way. After stopping for a moment, Apollo continued, if her father knew that it would come to this, maybe he will not be so insistent. Sigh. At the same time, Grimm suddenly trembled. He cried out, La Fay, has she gone back to Bysir Castle? Yes, yes. She must have gone back to Bysir Castle, she must have. Grimm's voice was filled with joy. At the same time, he hated himself for not realizing sooner. His mind was fixed at the twelve districts governed by the six great sorcerers' academies. He completely forgot about the place where La Fay and he came from. Come to think about it, Le Fay must have had a great deal of emotions attached to that place. After all, Bysir Castle was not only Le Fay's home, it was the place where she had fond memories of living with Grimm since they were little. Nina too was startled. Her two murky eyes lit up brilliantly and she exclaimed with joy as well. Yes, I was wondering why there wasn't any news of Le Fay. I see, so she has left the twelve districts. The more Grimm and Nina thought about it, the higher their hopes were. They couldn't help but smile. Grimm especially wished that he could fly over to Bysir Castle of the Eastern Coral Island to be by Le Fay's side at this very moment. Then, he would pull her over to Oldham's grave and make up for all his regrets. He wants to hold a grand wedding in the most romantic way possible and live with Le Fay by the ocean until the very last moments of her apprentice's life without any further remorse. He would protect her and do his very best to remove the black sorcerers. 
Grimm became more emotional the more he thought about it. He even felt a tinge in his lip from his beautiful past. It was his first kiss with Le Fay. The crescent moon was hanging by the sky and the air was filled with the sweet fragrance of orchids. The quiet river bay was flowing in a nice hum. At the deck of the dance floor before the new recruits test, passion was running high. Their hearts raced as they lost control in the moment without a care. At this moment, as he reminisces his sweet old past, Grimm suddenly felt that his life had been so bland after he had become a real sorcerer. This. Was it what the fatty and sorceress Elaine meant by saying sweet memories of the past after selling out the love files? The wheel of time in its every cycle buried the innocent, naive, intense, and fiery memories into the gentlest corner of the heart, turning them into its most prized treasures. But as the wheel of time turned increasingly, the sorcerers slowly lost touch of the beautiful innocence and naivety of the past. They soon became cold, factual incidents of the past. Such was the growth of a sorcerer. That was the price to pay in their search for the truth and power. Grimm suddenly stood up. He clutched his chest tightly, as though he was about to press his heart that had stopped beating for over two centuries but was beating crazily right now. Come, let's go to the eastern coral island, Le Fay must be there. Grimm fervently said to Nina. On the other hand, Mina took out its prized energy crystal and was reluctant to part ways. Good brother, as expected of a great being of ancient times, you really understand me. Here, don't be shy, this is my prized possession. Oh right, my name is Mavrika Nevichi, see you next time. Croak. 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 The red-eyed frog curled the energy crystal into its tongue and croaked. Oh right. You might not be aware of one thing. Le Fay's ancestor must be a level 2 or level 3 sorcerer. His father used to pay a bribe of. After parting ways with Apollo, Grimm and Nina went toward the eastern coral island from their memories and flew there excitedly. Chapter 277 The Jewel Sea Translator, Endless Fantasy Translation Editor, Endless Fantasy Translation Venturing into the unknown seas, even for a sorcerer, it was imperative to have a set of coordinates to be able to navigate through the seas accurately. But if it were the eastern coral island, Grimm could navigate by his soul's instinct alone to get to where he wanted to go. Seven days later, Grimm and Nina flew over the Jewel Sea at full speed. Common men would never dare to venture deep into the ocean. Only a heavy ocean liner passed through the seas occasionally. Most of the time, when the people aboard these ships saw some natural phenomena that were beyond their imaginations, they would tell of their own versions of tales that were usually blown out of proportion. The stories would spread, thus becoming legendary tales of the seas. These tales were the thin veils of how common men view truths. Buzz, 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 buzz. Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. Huh? Suddenly, Grim furrowed his brows as he watched over the horizon. His speed remained the same. Behind him, Nina exclaimed in astonishment, a school of golden wings. There's so many of them. The golden wing fish was a strange creature from the deep ocean. They would emerge and leap from the surface when they feel threatened. They would glide across the skies for a period of time until they feel safe enough to return back to the ocean. As they glided in the sky to avoid danger, their fins would turn into the shape of a wing and fly at high speed, thus the name Golden Wings. Other than that, there were also long horns on their heads that were extremely sharp. When the golden wings glide in a school, even a container ship in their path would be punctured into little holes, causing them to sink tragically into the ocean. It could be said that the fear of sailors when they spot a school of golden wings was equal to seeing a super dust storm in the deserts. The distant sky was covered in a patch of darkness. The number of golden wings was innumerable. Grim furrowed his brow and coldly said, Pay them no heed. Are you sure? Nina asked surprisingly. It was a huge school of golden wings. 
If they were to collide with them head on, even a sorcerer would. Core. Core. Rest assured, Nina. Master would protect you well. I remembered when the sky used to be covered with Amonros, when my master and I rescued the already hopeless Millie. Core, core, core. Tis but a piece of cake. The miner strutted its tail smugly as it perched on top of Grimm's shoulder. As they were talking, the school of golden wings got closer to them. Their flapping fins were creating buzzing sounds and whooshed as they glided across the sky. It was chaotic. Toward the distance, a tsunami that was hundreds of meters in height was approaching. The tsunami consisted of millions of golden wings that looked like it was about to swallow Grimm, Minor, and Nina in its path. As a dark sorceress who could already stand on her own, Nina naturally wouldn't place her fate into the hands of others. She had already started to channel some magical energy secretly, ready to protect herself. It was already too late to run away. Grim quietly shook his head as she saw Nina behaving this way. After all, she was no longer the innocent girl that would only cower behind Chris while addressing him as Big Brother Grim. Could it be that she thought he was having doubts about these trivial golden wing fishes that were on the run? He channeled some magical energy and called out, Negate! Poof! As Grim's sorcerer robes fluttered, a huge negating force caused the school of golden wing fish to glide along a sphere that was surrounding Grim's body, perfectly forming a negating force field. This way, he would be able to save more energy rather than taking the impact of the school of golden wings head on. Pa! 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 The arrow-like fishes were negated by Grimm's spherical force field. He merely moved his body slightly as he led Nina through the first wave of golden wings without reducing speed. There were still many golden wings around, but it was easy to deal with them and that they were of no threat. But what about the sorcerer's barriers? The barriers could not stop any creature from the sorcerer world from passing through them. They could only be manifested by the principal will to prevent the invasive foreign creatures. But due to the void fortresses, the ability could be manifested in foreign worlds, becoming one of the sorcerer world's huge milestones. Phew, finally. Boom. As the frail-looking Nina was about to breathe a sigh of relief, a thunderous explosion occurred on the sea surface. Nina stopped in her words. Her two murky round eyes caught hold of a humongous creature that covered the sun. In a blink of an eye, the ray from the sun was completely covered, casting a shadow over the two people and a bird. This, this is, the overlord Ubelina. Nina York cried out in astonishment. Overlord Ubelina. Even the weakest baby overlord Ubelina in the ocean was a level one creature. The toughest adult overlord Ubelina had, according to the records, exceeded the limits of a level 4 world lord. They were the strongest group of creatures in the oceans of the sorcerer world, the precious pets of the deep seas. When they ventured into the heart of the world, within the Black Sea Vortex, the oceanic race rode on mounts that belonged to a world lord overlord Ubelina. The overlord Ubelina that leaped from the surface of the ocean were thousands of meters in length. Obviously it was no baby. Slowly, the giant mouth of the overlord Ubelina opened up as it doved down from the sky. It almost seemed like it was about to swallow up Grimm, Nina, and the school of golden wings together. In the eyes of such an enormous creature, there was no distinction between Grimm, Nina, and the school of golden wings. The figures of the two people were barely visible. Grimm, run! This is a level 3 overlord Ubelina, there's no way we could. Nina cried out hysterically like an old witch. Her wrinkled faces made her look so worked up, like the exact picture of a bedtime story villain. Her thinning hair was blowing in the wind. Her frail, thin hand was clutching a dark-colored magical staff tightly. She was exerting too much energy on the staff, which made the joints in her hand look stiffer than usual. From the bottomless mouth of the giant creature, Nina not only saw the tightly packed sharp teeth of the overlord Ubelina. 
She also saw the terrifying unknown space in the depths of its throat. It was the Ubelina's guts, the final hell where creatures that had been swallowed up in whole made their final struggles. Hey, hey, Grim, this is no time for jokes, there's no fooling around that thing. As a dark sorceress, Nina's instinctive sense of danger almost broke her as she shook uncontrollably. Grim did not have any emotion beneath the mask of truth. Slowly, his eyelids opened up as he looked belittlingly at the overlord Ubelina that covered the sky in all its glory. A thick sorcerer's barrier was put up in an instant. A hexagram rank 3 on a badge was imprinted in the middle of the sorcerer's barrier. Almost at the same time, the protective aura of the principal will of the sorcerer world descended upon. Woo! The overlord Ubelina that was in mid-air twisted its body and avoided their paths in a huge wail. Grim however, did not let up and kept flying ahead. Boom! A huge wave splashed hundreds of meters in height. Grim had already led the stunned Nina through the wall of water. As the natural forces gathered in the lines of the waves, they flew straight toward the eastern coral island without stopping. Still in shock, Nina looked puzzlingly at Grimm, wondering how Grimm did that. Why did the level 3 overlord Ubelina avoid him in fear? Nina could not understand at all. She could not hold it in her any further and asked, Grimm, just now, how did it? Grimm smiled helplessly. He pointed at the honor badge at his sorcerer's barrier. It wasn't afraid of me, but it was afraid of the great sorcerer's will. Nina, you must remember that this world is called the Sorcerer World. The oceanic races are merely crawling insects under the Sorcerer's will. They're quite similar to the slaves of the Endless Worlds. Grimm's voice was filled with confidence and cruelty. It was the combination of the utter cruelty of a dark sorcerer mixed with the cold confidence of a demon hunter. Nina York stared blankly at Grimm. In her dimmed pair of eyes, Grim at the moment was all too unfamiliar and mysterious. Just like. Just like during the Holy Tower qualification battles. Grim was an enigmatic presence that was beyond Nina's understanding, a miracle in Nina's eyes. She thought that after becoming a real sorceress, since they were at the same level, she was now on equal terms as Big Brother Grim and stood at the same height as him. But now, the difference in their level seemed to have grown much further apart. The difference in their levels was enough to make Nina treat him with respect, thus letting others realize their staggering differences in power. Although she was filled with bitterness, she still pulled a face that showed that she was proud of Grim. She tried to force a smile. Grim, tell me about your demon hunting expedition. I've always hoped to earn enough sorcerer essence to travel around the foreign worlds once. How was it, was it fun? Grim shook his head and coldly said, the first demon hunting expedition I went to was called the Shadow World. Chapter 278, The Eastern Coral Island Translator, Endless Fantasy Translation Editor, Endless Fantasy Translation Ten Days Later Across the distance, a huge ferry was being chased by another smaller ship. The large ferry was a hundred meters long, while the smaller ship appeared to be sixty meters in length. The small ship launched ropes onto the larger ship and immobilized it. The people in the smaller ship wore patchwork clothes and were quick to move. They shouted their war cries and glided along the ropes to board the ship. They were holding simple weapons as they launched their attacks. Hem? Pirates. Grim was standing in midair as he looked at the chaotic scene on the deck. His eyes were fixed on a female knight. The knight wore a helmet and was fully clad in silver armor. She was carrying a long sword and was faltering under the attacks of three excited pirates. Still, she clenched her teeth, not willing to give up. There was a mole at the corner of her lips. For Grim, this was the perfect image of a wife when he was still young. Ha ha, we're in luck. We've got a girl here. I'll. Bastard, spare your strength. 
If you dare hurt her I'll tear off your limbs and feed them to the sharks. Two of the three attacking pirates had red-filled eyes like a pack of hungry wolves that had seen a lamb. They looked like they were about to have their way with her at that moment. Only one of the pirates was relatively calm. He knew that such a nice reward was only reserved for their leader. How could underlings like them ever have their turn? The pirate shook his head. He wore a metal brace around his hands. After surveying his surroundings, he became startled. He started to rub his eyes frantically. The pirate was trembling, his mouth was agape. He pointed toward the sky. White-headed ghost, what are you doing? The two pirates that were ganging up on the female knight yelled out after seeing the stunned pirate who had metal braces in his hands. S.O.R. Sorcerers. Sorcerers. After the pirate came around, he pointed to the sky with his index finger. He cried out in hysteria. In the seas, sorcerers were nightmares that were on par with the sea monsters. They were the greatest, unknown fears of the pirates. Clink. The pirate who was pointing at Grimm was turned into an ice sculpture. Grimm slowly descended from the sky and coldly looked at the pirate. The dignity of sorcerers shall not be defiled. Clang. The ice statue shattered into tiny crystal fragments. Grimm swapped Mina's essence of ice body with Brianna's water-boiling runic abilities. Although he still couldn't use a more advanced principle of the spell, it was more than enough to deal with a normal human being. You. Clink. At the corner of Grimm's eyes beneath the Mask of Truth, another pirate who was pointing at Grimm turned into an ice sculpture as well. The rest of the pirates were already scared beyond their wits. They threw down their weapons and cried in anguish. Grimm paid no attention to them. He looked at the female knight's eyes, which looked like the startled eyes of a bunny. He asked in a hoarse voice, How far is it from here to the eastern coral island? About, about three days' journey. The female knight answered falteringly. She was also in fear. It was the primal fear that a low-level being has when faced with a higher being that could kill any time he wanted, like when Grimm was faced with the stigmata sorcerer of Black Isotta. Grimm couldn't care less about what these human thought. Though, the stubborn female knight that looked pitiful just now was Grimm's image of a perfect wife when he was younger. Grimm continued to ask, Did you come from the eastern coral island? Yes. The female knight nodded frantically. Okay. After Grimm's reply, he made a fireball between his fingers. It was glowing brightly like a nulicris and tiny sun. The temperature around the fireball rose up dramatically. The surrounding air became twisted. The wooden deck under Grimm's feet started to curl up under the heat. No, please, don't kill me, I would give you anything. The female knight's face was pale. She begged at Grimm terrifyingly as she crawled backwards, trying to hold on to something to shield herself from this demon. Grimm looked at the female knight confusingly. Then, it dawned upon him. He let out a quiet sigh, as if his dream had been shattered. He slowly turned around toward the pirate ship. No. In the distance, the leader of the pirates was squealing in a futile manner. Waves of fire rose up in an ear-shattering explosion. Wooden debris flew across the sky. The remaining pirates wailed hopelessly on the burning ship, which was quickly consumed by the fire and sunk into the ocean. Ah! Why? You bastard! Why? Why would a high sorcerer like you get involved with? Before the leader of the pirates could finish his speech, his eyeballs popped up. His face, body, and limbs started to twitch in an odd faction. Rip. As he cried exasperatingly like a baby, his body was ripped into a few portions. They turned into tentacles and started to eat each other up. This was the first time Grimm had tried out dissimulation sorcery in the field. The scene after the remains had dissimulated looked horrid, even by sorcerer's standard. Arg. Ah. 
the horrifying scene not only terrorized the pirates on the ship. Even the traveling merchants, sailors, and knights became petrified as they distanced themselves from this evil demon. Grim flew upward casually as he asked rhetorically, why? For justice. A while later, Grim returned into the sky and calmly said, not bad, we'll reach the eastern coral island today. A few days worth of journey was but one or two hourglasses for the sorcerers. Nina, who was chatting with the miner turned around in confusion. What's that all about? Why did you get into the trivial fights of the humans? It's nothing. I was just fulfilling a meaningless childhood dream. Grim replied nonchalantly as they continued their flight. After about two hourglasses. As more and more ships appeared beneath their feet, Grim and Nina who was tearing across the sky in breakneck speed saw a dash of land on the horizon. Nina cried out with joy, we're finally here. Suddenly, Grim thought of something. He turned toward Nina and asked, where did you live? Do you want to go check it out first? But Nina became depressed. She shook her head and said, there's nothing much to see. I came back after becoming a real sorcerer. There was just, nothing. Nina was probably referring to her parents and relatives when she said there was nothing there anymore. After all, a century was too long for the average human being, not to mention that Nina had probably taken more than a century to become a sorcerer. Or should an old woman suddenly trace back her bloodline, and say to another old woman that she was her great-grandmother from centuries ago? It would be a trivial, meaningless act. Grim nodded and said softly, well, let's fly toward Bysir Castle then. Krakato Port. This was the port where Grim and the rest of the bunch departed from when they first left the eastern coral island. Until now, Grim was still intrigued by the mysterious moon well. But since Grim had missed LaFay so much, he didn't stay around to study the moon well. She led Nina to tear across the sky. Oh right, Grim, do you still remember the Viscount who gave us a grand send-off at Krakato Port? He had some baby fat on his face, the one who always liked to twist the red ruby ring on his right thumb, asked Nina. Grim nodded. I could still remember some, what is it? Nina continued on slowly. I only knew about this after I became a real sorcerer and came back. He was actually a real sorcerer that was hiding in the secluded region of the eastern coral island. Grim was intrigued. But he merely nodded and didn't really care all that much. Two days later. Grim, who was filled with excitement, suddenly came to a halt as they flew over by Seer Castle. At the street beneath their feet, a squadron of battle-worn knights that had stern expressions held out their long swords as they paraded the streets, chanting sacrifice, with pride. There were common people on both sides of the street. There were decorations all around, and they were cheering. At the back of the parade, prisoners whose faces were covered in dust were tied up by metal chains. The scene was a far cry of what Grimm had in mind. He thought that the streets would be broken and corrupted, and that the bottom feeders were constantly oppressed by those who had a higher standing in society. He also thought that there was something twisted in the prosperity of the streets. Chapter 279 The Chamber of Despair Translator, Endless Fantasy Translation Editor, Endless Fantasy Translation There were about 300 men in the cavalry troop. They were all clad in sturdy metal armors and displayed great discipline in their actions unlike the night wannabes that Grimm saw amongst the nobles or the lowly uncivilized knights who visit the pubs. These knights were, basically an army of their own. According to what Grimm knew, most areas of the Seven Ring Holy Tower Academies, not just the eastern coral island, were split into various sections according to their sorcerers' castles and nobles. It was unthinkable for the nobles, who usually were only interested in indulging in luxury and pleasures, to want to organize a fully trained army. After all, no matter how strong the knights they acquired, these warriors were nothing but papers in the eyes of the sorcerers. In the eyes of the sorcerers, 
these night cavalry recruiting was entirely pointless. Nina York's usual turbid eyes were glowing with excitement as she looked at Grimm, trying to spot a glimpse of his emotion from under his mask of truth. These, are these Millie's workings? Nina York asked. Looking at the cheering peasants on the street, Grimm shook his head and answered, I don't know. Perhaps. Perhaps. These displayed peace and joy on the streets were nothing but a front to cover up the real evil that was hiding in the shadows. No matter how skilled a black sorcerer was, his or her specimen would most likely be left with major damage after going through the human despair harvesting process. Due to Nina York pampering Miner a lot, it was now standing on her shoulder instead of Grimm's. Seeing his master's response, Miner let out a mischievous laugh and said, Cor Cor, my master. How about I head down and do a sweep of surveillance first? Shifting his eyes from the cheering peasants to the knights chained prisoners and finally to the biggest castle door in Bysir City, Grimm's mind was starting to calm down as he inched towards the truth. Ignoring Minor Grimm turned around and looked at a certain direction, at one spot, that spot was once his home. It doesn't matter who the city owner is, we shouldn't disturb the peaceful lives of this city's citizens. It's best that we begin our investigation at night. As for now. Nina York was surprised by his reply. All your relatives are now long dead. Why would you want to care about the feelings of these ordinary humans? Ignoring her question, Grimm flew towards that place that still dwelled in his distant memory. A moment later. Grimm and Nina York both landed on a muddy road. This was the road that every villager used to commute into Bysir City. There was no one using the road at the moment. Landing on the road, Grimm's shoes had sunk partially into the mud. However, Grimm was not bothered by this at all. In fact, he appeared to enjoy it, using his toe tip to impale the soft muddy soil beneath. This brought back all the memories he had with Oldham, the good old days when he and Oldham were on the carriage. Nina York, on the other hand, was hovering above the ground. She wasn't fond of the dirty muddy soil. If you don't mind, it's better for you to land on the ground here. After saying this, Grim tore open a pocket dimension and grabbed two pieces of peasant clothing from the ocean of clothes within, then, he threw one of them to Nina York. Grim prepared these clothes for his future research on dissimulation sorcery. Letting out a sigh, Nina York stepped on the muddy ground and received the clothes that Grim was handing over. Without saying anything, she quickly changed into the clothes that were given to her. Cor? Master. After changing into the peasant clothing, Grim threw Miner into the pocket dimension without hesitation. Then, he led Nina York along the muddy road. Two hundred years had passed. Thus, it was natural that the entire village and surrounding geography had massively changed. This was not the same place that Grimm remembered. Grimm could still vaguely remember there were only thirty to forty families living in the village that he and Oldham lived. Other than that, there were also vast distances between the houses too, it was a rare sight to see neighbours living close to one another. Yet now, there were hundreds of villagers living close to one another. It was not the village that had vast space as he remembered. It would also appear that they did not usually have visitors. Under the sunset, the weak elderly were staring at Grimm and Nina York. Ignoring the old villagers' stares, Grimm and Nina York kept on walking, passing by a pair of old farmers who were returning home from a long day's work. Then, there it was. Grimm's eyes lit up as he saw it. Hold on. It was still there. And it was under preservation too. Stunned by what he saw, Grimm stood there quietly as he looked at the old beaten stone house. He could feel a sting of bittersweet nostalgia hit his nose. The old stone house, the old horse, these were Old Ham's treasures. A long time ago. Old Ham once decided to spend the two piece of gold coins, his all year wage, to renovate this house. And then, he wanted to help Grimm finding a wife to help Grimm start a family. 
his greatest dream was to hold a grandchild in his arms. Yet. Oldham did not get to realize his dream. After slaving off all his life, he did not get to see his grandchild in his twilight years. In the end, he did not get to enjoy the warmth of a full family. Grimm quickly rubbed his eyes, trying to hide his fragile side from his companion. So, this is where you lived? Nina York asked. Although the stone house was already old and beaten up, its entire structure was still preserved and protected by various finely lined up wooden pillars. At a glance, this old house looked odd rather than old. Crack! As he opened the wooden door, Grimm walked into the familiar place he once called home, the simple furniture, the bed that he once slept in, though now his bed sheet and blanket had been taken away. Putting his finger on the wooden bed, Grimm saw that there was only a thin layer of dust. It would appear that it had been periodically cleaned by someone. As nostalgia beginning to wear off, Grimm took in a deep breath, intending to inhale this familiar scent. Then, Grimm grinned. He could almost smell the days that he spent with Old Town, and that small whiff of a lovely scent. Grimm turned to Nina York with a smile, it would appear that. Le Fay has indeed returned. Nightfall. Millions of stars had splattered across the black sky as the crescent moon curved mysteriously amongst them. Under the cloak of night sat a girl. The girl's hair, ashen black and silky long, was dangling freely in the wind as though trying to blend into the black night. Her skin was fair as snow, as though not ever stained by dirt. Her tall and shapely body was so perfect that as though it had received the grace and blessings from nature itself. And finally, her red rosy lips were so lovely that a sight of it was like courting the devil itself. This lady was carrying the peak of her beauty. Like a recently blossomed flower, so lovely and stunning. And yet. Ah, you monster, you evil black sorcerer. I'm not going to let this slide even after I'm dead. The flame of candles had lit the room, casting various shadows of blooded metal cuffs on the stone walls that had icy cold water dripping on it. Excruciating screams and wailing could be heard in the room as though they were cries of demons. A prisoner, clad in a rags, stared at the two black eyes with extreme horror. Hem? Perhaps I should increase the despair level when I harvest. Her refined fair fingers slowly pulled out the metal needles from within the prisoner's body. Then, a silver ray flashed through the air. One of the prisoner's fingers dropped to the ground. Arga. Agonizing wailing echoed in the chamber as the prisoner stared at his cut-off finger. Finger? Cut off? His now, not whole anymore. Tears rolled down the prisoner's eyes as despair overflowed in him. Hum, that's it. As the Lady Kami mumbled, a grotesque tumor hidden in her long hair behind her head twitched a little. Then, she started to bandage the prisoner and help him to stop bleeding. Black sorcerers' methods of collecting despair were different. They were not like the demon hunters who killed and slaughtered to collect despair. In the eyes of the black sorcerers, normal humans that were used to collect despair were like rechargeable batteries, their despair was a kind of replenishable resources. Thus, unless they were cut to pieces and expended all their uses, these humans would not be allowed to die. The black sorcerer's lab, it was indeed a depressing and despairing hell. After bandaging the prisoner, the girl then looked at the other cages with her calm eyes. Seeing this, the other dismembered prisoners had started to sob in despair awaiting the ambassador of hell toying with them again. These were all thirty to forty-year-old men. Yet, they were sobbing and crying like infants. Suddenly, the metal door that sealed the underground lab was opened. The door appeared to have been enchanted with some sort of sorcery, in a brief tremble, the door was shattered into pieces like a bubble. Then, two silhouettes walked in. Seeing them, the girl's body was stunned as though she was shocked by electric current. One of them, who looked like an old witch in the old folklores, looked at the blooded knife in the girl's hand and said in trembling voice, You. 
The other one was wearing a grey mask that was embedded with a spiral marking and had long golden hair. Under his mask, his eyes were filled with tears. Le Fay, you've come back. Oh, thank goodness. Clank. The blooded knife fell off from the girl's hand. She quickly covered her face with her hands, like a small child who was caught stealing candies red-handed and started to weep in front of them. Chapter 280, Regret, Sorry, Repent Translator, Endless Fantasy Translation Editor, Endless Fantasy Translation I No I Le Fay covered her face in tears as she hid behind one of the cages. Her body was trembling from the overflowing emotions. Grim. No, don't come near me. I don't want you to see me, to see this ugly version of me. I'm. I'm a sinner. I'm. I'm an evil black sorcerer. Nina York clenched her teeth to hold in the ache she felt in her heart as she said, Le Fay. I think you should. No. Grim yelled loudly before begging Nina York with his quivering voice, Please, Nina York. I've wasted two hundred years already. Le Fay is the love of my life. Please give me a chance to repent. Please allow me to be by her side in her final days. To repent my regret. Nina York replied in a sore voice, Grim, do you know what you're saying? Ha 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 ha. Evil black sorcerer, you're going to face your doom. The pain and agony that we felt would befall you ten times. No, hundred times fold. Oh great sorcerer, please slay this evil mons, ah. Oh. A warp of dimension distortion slashed across the chamber, and the chirpy prisoner was clasped into a ball together with his metal cage. Seeing this, the prisoners, who thought they were finally able to see hope, were horrified as they stared at Grimm. No. He was not their hope. He was the actual devil himself. Grim. You're a demon hunter. If you're going to protect a black sorcerer apprentice, the Holy Tower will surely lay down harsh punishments on you. You need to snap out of it. Nina York glared at Grim. Grim replied determinedly, Nina York, I know what I'm doing. Do you still remember how we survived our ride on the ship back then? We were just a bunch of arrogant, ignorant brats. It was our first meeting with the harshness in the world of sorcerers. Without anyone to rely on, we were allowed to live all because of Le Fay's reputation as the vine caster. As for the holy tower, Grim took a gaze at the tearing Le Fay before stepping towards her slowly. His gaze was filled with love and care. He saw his younger self pulling her up to the ship's deck from the ocean. He saw how after faceless Nilmar hijacked the ship, Le Fay formed a group of children and relied on one another to keep on surviving. He saw how the drunk girl kissed him forcefully before the gory test. He saw after the Holy Tower qualification battles, how beautiful her smile was when she was holding the wine in the celebration ball. And now, two hundred years had passed since Grimm underwent biological lifespan evolution. And two hundred years were an obscenely long time for a sorcerer apprentice. No, Grimm. Please, stay away. I'm not Le Fay. I'm just an ugly evil black sorcerer, sob, kill me. Just kill me. I've got a lot of bounty on my head. I don't deserve any sympathy at all. Just kill me already. Pushing Grim away tearfully, Le Fay continued on crying out senseless words in an attempt to cover up her ugliness in front of the love of her life. At this moment, she was no longer a powerful evil black sorcerer apprentice. She was just an anxious and disgraced girl. Grim, without hesitation, grabbed the bloody hands that were pushing his chest. Drip. Grim's tears were overflowing in his eyes, rolling down on his grey mask and onto her icy cold hands. Le Fay, stop. Don't say anything anymore. I don't care what wrongs you did. I don't care how others see you. I want you to know that I will always be by your side, guarding you. 
This is love. This is our love for each other. Holding Lefay's hands tightly, it was as though Grimm was trying to physically provide her all of his care, the care of a man for his beloved. Raising her eyes that were no longer crystal clear after succumbing to the sunder of time, Lefay looked at Grimm and felt for the first time in the longest of time, a sense of safety. This was a feeling that told her that this was a man that she could trust with all her heart, that he would love her with all his heart without prejudice. Lefay felt as though her heart was shattering into pieces. She then collapsed into Grimm's arms and started sobbing silently. Finally she was able to put down all the weight on her mind. Now, she only wanted to rest Grimm's arms and let it all out. She finally got to cry it all out like any ordinary girl, releasing all the pain and despair that she had felt in the last two centuries. Don't worry. Allow me to handle this. Le Fay, I will do my best to repay all that I've done wrong. To repent my regret. I will make everything right again. Grim whispered in Le Fay's ears. Le Fay's quiet sobbing escalated into a loud weep. Putting his hand on his mouth, Grim struggled to cover his sobbing, to conceal the feeble side of his. He must not show any sign of weakness, so that Le Fay could feel safe. Combing his fingers on Lefay's hair, the long hair bulging behind her head curtained down. Gulp. An ugly tumor could be seen twitching. Grim could feel a fling of sadness and relief after seeing this. He felt sad because Lefay was indeed controlled by some other shady entity. This would mean that Grim would need to deal with an actual black sorcerer to fight for Lefay's freedom. On the other hand, he was also relieved that she was controlled. This meant that Le Fay had not turned to the dark side willingly. Thus, according to the laws of Holy Tower, she was not criminal. She was a victim. Nina York too saw the tumor and started to calm down as memories came flowing in her mind. She recalled that other than her own brother, it was this black sorcerer apprentice in front of her who always shielded her when she was just a child. And now, could she hurt this woman? who had sacrificed so much for her in the past. And that was not all. She was forced and blackmailed to become a black sorcerer apprentice. Under this circumstance, even if the Holy Tower wanted to punish Grimm, the punishment would not be too severe. Thus, despite being a cold dark sorcerer, Nina York was not able to disagree and reject Grimm's plea anymore. Slowly, Nina York let out a breath of sigh and took a gaze at the pair of lovebirds. I understand. Grim, Le Fay. I will wait outside. Finishing her words, Nina York looked at the embracing duo caringly and shut the metal door softly, giving them some private time and space. As for the prisoners, they were essentially dead the moment Nina York gave in. This was, of course, going to be Grimm's responsibility. Resting in Grimm's arms, Le Fay, who still retained her youthful look, sobbed, until the moment I was forced to choose to live or to die. I realized then how terrifying death is. It's an agony of losing every hope. I wanted to see you, for one last time. I couldn't let go. I couldn't bear to just die and lose you. I know. I understand. I can't bear to lose you too. There was a whimper in Grimm's voice. Then, Le Fay started to hammer her fists on Grimm's chest, then why? Why? Why didn't you come and visit me in the last two hundred years? Why? Drowning with regrets, Grimm grabbed her hands and replied, I'm sorry. It's all my fault. He had no excuse. No excuse indeed. All he could do was accept the love of his life scolding him in his arms. Finally, Le Fay stopped and was able to relax. She closed her eyes as she rested her head on Grimm's chest. It was like a dream. Le Fay. Grimm whispered. Hem? Resting on his chest, Le Fay softly replied, like a cuddling kitten. She was once a forceful queen. Yet, after the two hundred year torment, she only wanted to enjoy the love her beloved man provided her. Her eyes were shut, 
not thinking of anything else. Gazing at Lefe determinedly, Grimm said, let's get married. The way you had always dreamt of, 